Chapter 5. I was frozen for a minute, barely able to process or believe what had just happened. I stared at the space where the train had been until the night swallowed it up and I couldn't even hear it anymore. The full moon came into view, bathing the spot where we stood with weak light. Stars were dotted here and there. With the train gone, everywhere was silent. No crickets throbbing in the grass. No traffic rushing on nearby roads. All I could hear was my own heavy breathing. Slowly, my eyes adjusted to the darkness. We were in the middle of the countryside somewhere not too far, I assumed, from the Romanian border, though it was impossible to estimate how much ground the train had covered before the guards had expelled us. And I wasn't familiar with Romanian geography. All I knew was that it was an alien landscape, and that we were a very long way from home. On my left, without a compass I had no way of knowing what direction I was facing, the ground rolled and swelled, an undulating landscape of hills and valleys, trees clinging to steep slopes, an expanse of water in the distance winking silver when the moon showed its face. Beyond, looking down on the hills like elders standing guard over their children, were mountains, jagged and foreboding. They reminded me of the Tolkien books I'd read as a teenager, the hobbits setting off on a treacherous journey in search of the ring. In the other direction the ground was flat and covered in thick forest which stretched for miles. In the far distance, beyond the forest, another row of jagged mountains formed the horizon. A number of silent birds, black in the dim light, rose from the trees on the forest's edge before swooping and vanishing again. During the day, with the sun shining, it would no doubt be beautiful. But not now. Not on a night like this. The station was tiny, with just two platforms which were connected by a narrow footbridge. There were no lights, the station appeared to be out of use. There was a small, wooden building with weathered, flaking paintwork that would have once been the ticket office, I guessed. I turned in a slow circle. There were a few dark, similarly abandoned looking buildings nearby. It looked like a village, a settlement really, that had died at some point in the not too distant past. Daniel. I turned slowly to face Laura, who stood hugging herself on the dimly lit platform. Daniel, she said again, more urgently. I stepped over to my girlfriend and pulled her into an embrace, feeling her soft hair against my face. The temperature had dropped significantly and she was shivering in her shorts and t-shirt. Goosebumps rippled on the flesh of her arms, her teeth chattered. I looked around for my backpack, which lay on the concrete, its contents spilling out like guts. I dug out a hoodie, which I passed to Laura. She stared at it like she didn't know what it was. Come on, sweetheart, I said. Put it on. She looked at me with wide eyes, jerking her head round at a movement in a tree overhead. A bird, its silhouette just visible among the black branches. We're going to be okay, I said, but I sounded like I was trying to reassure myself more than her. In fact, she seemed to be recovering from the shock more quickly than me, as she cracked a weak joke, when I said I wanted to go off the beaten track, I didn't mean this far off it. Alina stood a few feet away, gazing along the tracks, seemingly in a trance. Do you know where we are? I asked. She didn't reply. Alina. I went up to her and finally, she snapped out of it. I repeated my question. She looked around and shook her head. What the fuck just happened? I asked. Where was I on? And why didn't you wake us like you said you would? She rubbed her eyes, shook herself awake. I. I fell. Asleep. An ion. He went to the dining car to get something to eat. I must. I guess I was only asleep for five minutes, maybe ten. When I saw the border guard and the ticket inspector heading towards you I jumped up straight away, came to help. And that went really well. She hung her head. I'm so sorry. Then her eyes lit up. That guard, what a fucker. If I ever see him again, I'm going to kick his ass so bad. I'm cold. We both turned around. Laura was still hugging herself, her eyes as round and wide as the sun that had burned so brightly on the first part of our trip. The beaches of Italy and Spain seemed a very long way away now. I tried to hug her again but this time she flinched away. 
If you'd booked us into a sleeper carriage in the first place, hadn't been so bloody tight. I protested. We might still have been robbed. No. No, we wouldn't. She raked her hands through her hair and sighed. I shouldn't have agreed to go into the sleeper carriage. I knew it was a bad idea. I thought it would be okay. Dot single quote. I trailed off. I'm sorry. Alina turned away to give us privacy and produced a crumpled packet of cigarettes from her pocket. She lit one, sucked on it hungrily, then looked over her shoulder. At least you guys still have your stuff. All mine is still on the fucking train. Have you got a phone? I asked. She checked her jeans pockets, pulling out her passport, glancing at it, and sighing. No. It was in my bag. And mine is dead. The battery had shed its last scraps of energy while I was asleep. Laura. It's in my backpack. She knelt and rummaged through the backpack, then raised her face to the sky. It's not there. They must have stolen it along with the other stuff. I swore. Someone must have looked into the compartment, seen us asleep, decided to try their luck. Hey, maybe it was that guy. The one who kept staring at you. Did you see him, Alina? Did he leave the carriage? I don't know. I didn't see. She took a long drag on her cigarette. It doesn't matter, does it? Said Laura. It's all gone. We'll never know who it was. She looked around. I don't like this place. It feels. Haunted. In a bad way. Alina raised an eyebrow. Haunted. You believe in ghosts? Yes. To my relief, she didn't say anything else. I had long since accepted Laura's belief in the supernatural but felt slightly embarrassed when she mentioned it to other people. And I really didn't want to talk about ghosts, right here and now. Alina must have seen me staring at her cigarette because she held it up and said, you want one? No. Thanks. She shrugged and approached the ticket office, peered through the filthy glass. There's a map, she said. I stood beside her at the window. Laura came over to look too. An A2 sized map showing what I assumed to be the local area hung on the wall opposite the window. It was just possible to make out a red arrow, indicating where we were, but in the half light I couldn't discern any of the place names. Can you read it? I asked Alina. Kind of. I think that green area there is the Apusani. Natural park. So we're in that area of forest just below it. She squinted. There's a town, not too far. I scrutinized the black dot she was referring to. The name was short but I couldn't read it. Not that it really mattered. All we needed to know was that it was a town. People. Civilization. Did you notice if we went through a town on the train, before? We got here. I asked. I think so. Yes, I'm pretty sure we did. We all turned and looked at the tracks, leading back the way we'd traveled. Whoever had built the railway had cut a wide path through the trees, slicing the forest in two. It was wide enough for two tracks, with another two meters of clear ground either side of the rails. Only the first few meters of this path were visible. Beyond pitch darkness. How far do you think it is? Hmm. I don't know. Nine or ten kilometers. So that's, what, six or seven miles. Laura put her hand on my arm. You're not thinking of trying to walk there, or you? Wouldn't we be better off heading out of the station, trying to find a road? I don't know, Alina said. You can see here, on the map, the train track runs straight to the town. The road also goes into the forest, but is much longer. As she said that, a noise came from the blackness at the far end of the platform. Laura's grip on my arm tightened, her fingertips digging into my flesh. What the fuck was that? She said, her voice escalating a pitch. Something growled. Alina took a few tentative steps along the platform towards the noise. It's a dog, she said quietly. The growl came again and the dog came into view to our left, at the end of the platform, the mountains behind it. Then, as Alina backed away, another appeared. Two black dogs. They looked a little like Dobermans, but slightly smaller and completely black. They stared at us, silent now, but with drawn back lips that displayed two sets of sharp, yellowish teeth. 
Laura stepped behind me. She has always been afraid of dogs. My parents have a black Labrador, a docile but boisterous creature, and whenever Laura visited, the dog would have to be locked in the kitchen because Laura found him frightening. It stemmed from her mother, who was attacked by a dog when she was a kid, passing on her lifelong fear to her own child. Alina had moved slowly back to stand beside the window. Laura was gripping my arm so hard that I would have bruises the next day. One of the dogs took a step forward and growled again, low and menacing. A word popped into my head. Rabies. With it came images of foaming mouths, thrashing bodies, heat and pain and death. I think, Alina whispered, I would rather walk to the nearest town than stay here with them. If we walk along the edge of the tracks it should only take a couple of hours. What time is it? Laura asked. I checked my watch. Just after three. Then we'll be there in time for breakfast, Alina said. I nodded. Laura, are you okay with this plan? She looked at the dogs, then turned her head to look along the tracks. It's too dark. How the hell are we supposed to find our way? They're railroad tracks. We just follow them. And I have the torch, remember? I had slipped the skinny maglite into my backpack at the last minute when packing back home, thinking it might come in handy. I had stopped short of bringing a Swiss army knife, but only because I didn't own one. Laura looked at the dogs, then at the tracks, then back at the dogs, both of which took another step forward, teeth on display. Okay, Laura said, her voice just audible above it, growling of the two. Dogs. We backed slowly away from the dogs, careful not to make any sudden movements. I bent and picked up the two backpacks, passing Laura's to her, and we slung them onto our backs, but not before I'd retrieved the torch, which I switched on, relieved to find that it worked. We walked to the end of the platform, passing beneath the footbridge. Someone had graffitied a crude image of a man with huge genitals which were pointed at a smaller female figure. Next to that was a drawing of a devil, its face contorted into a scream. Averting my eyes, hoping my girlfriend hadn't seen the graffiti, I followed Alina down onto the tracks, taking care to stay away from the rails in case they were live. I held Laura's hand and we began to walk towards the trees, onto the track that cut through the forest. Chapter 6. We walked along beside the rails, the forest to our left, tracks to our right. The trees formed a wall beside us, as still as sentries. In some places the taller trees bent forward to create a threadbare canopy, their tips touching the tops of their counterparts across the tracks, as if they were reaching out trying to fill the gap that had been ripped through them. I tried not to look at them too much, concentrating on the ground beneath my feet, the few meters ahead that were illuminated by the torch. The flat space between the forest edge and the rails was dry and crunchy, seed pods and leaves scattered around, along with the occasional sign of human life, a rusted beer can or crisp packet that had been thrown from a passing train. Alina lit another cigarette which, when finished, she paused to tread out. It was so quiet that I had started chatting almost as soon as. We left the station behind, eager to fill the oppressive silence. I'm starving, I said now. I wonder what we'll be able to get for breakfast in this town. We haven't got any money, Laura responded. She had changed out of her shorts into a pair of jeans and had stopped shivering. I've got a little in my pocket, I said. I don't suppose you've got a bottle of gin in there too. No, but I've got some water in my backpack. Hang on. I found the half-empty bottle of mineral water and passed it to her. She took a sip and offered it to Alina, who waved a hand to say no thanks. I groped for something else to say. This is a bit like that film, I said. You know, the one with River Phoenix, when those boys go walking through the woods along the train tracks. Stand by me, Laura said. At the end they find. A dead body. This is nothing at all like. That film with River Phoenix, I said. She laughed. As we went further along the path she seemed to relax a little, especially when the clouds above shifted to reveal a bright moon. It helped illuminate the path, so I was able to switch off the torch. 
I squeezed Laura's hand and she squeezed back. I bet Ion was shocked when he saw that you'd been kicked off the train, I said to Alina. He was probably pleased. Why do you say that? She looked at us sideways. We had an argument. That's why he went to the dining car. To get away. Have you been together long? Laura asked. Him. Laura and I exchanged a glance, but Alina didn't say any more. Have you ever been to England? I asked, trying to keep the conversation going. Every time it fell silent I could hear noises from the forest, rustling, swishing, unseen things stirring in the darkness. No. You should, I said. I'm sure you'd like London, if you're an artist. My best friend is a musician, a singer. He reckons London is the most creative city in Europe. I wondered what Jake would say when I told him about this escapade. It comforted me to think I could turn this experience into an amusing anecdote, even though I knew that Jake would tell everyone we knew about it. I think next year Romanians will be free to come and work in the UK, I kept on. The right-wingers have been banging on about it like we're going to be invaded. Alina made a non-committal noise, then said, so what do you think of Romania so far? Laura and I laughed. Laura said, oh, I'm going to recommend it to all my friends. I particularly like the forests, and the border guards are just lovely. So welcoming. I couldn't see Alina's face well, and wasn't sure if her question had been sarcastic or sincere. The former, I thought, but didn't want to risk offending her so I said, I'm sure once we get everything sorted out, and get back to civilization, we'll love it. If I were you, Alina said, after this I'd get on the first plane out of here. I was about to say something about how much I'd been looking forward to seeing Sayasora when Laura grabbed my arm and said, did you hear that? I froze. What? A clicking noise. Like animal claws. She made a spidery gesture. With her fingers. Oh God, I said. Maybe the dogs are following us. I switched the torch back on and shone it behind us. Just an expanse of rail track. I took a few steps forward but there was no sign of the dogs or anything else. It's fine, Alina said as I rejoined them. I'm sure it's just the branches of the trees. It's natural. To feel scared in places like this. Let's just keep walking. In a straight line. Okay. Okay, I said. Laura didn't respond. Okay. I said to her as gently as I could. Are there animals in the forest? She said, addressing Alina. I guess. Dot single quote. Laura's eyes widened. What kind of animals? Wolves. Bears. I don't know. I interjected quickly. I think it said in my guidebook that all the wolves and bears have been hunted to extinction around here. Laura looked at me like I was the world's worst liar. I just want to get out of here as quickly as possible. Her voice broke at the end of the sentence. We'll be in town soon, I said. Eating breakfast. And when this is all over we'll look back and. Single quote. She started walking, striding forward with a new purpose, as if the backpack on her back was filled with feathers. I looked warily towards the forest. I had lied about the bears. As far as I knew, there were still brown bears living wild in this part of Romania. Though, to be honest, I was more worried about Laura than I was about the local wildlife. Did she really blame me for what had happened? It was a fact that if I'd booked a sleeper compartment to start with, we would have been safely tucked up in our bunks with the door locked. Nobody would have stolen our stuff. We wouldn't have met Alina and got chucked off the train. Everything would be fine. Whether or not Laura held me responsible, I regretted the decision I'd made. If I could turn back the clock. Unfortunately, real life has no erase button. There was nothing I could do about it now. We just had to get out of here and then, I truly believed, we would be able to laugh about it. I increased my pace to catch up with Laura, and Alina followed suit. I waited for Laura to speak, even though the silence was agonizing. Finally, she said, I suppose I did want adventure. Laura, I'm sorry I didn't book a sleeper. If I'd known, she held up a hand. Daniel, it's okay. I don't blame you. Of course you didn't know this would happen. 
You know I'm not the kind of person who sulks or bears grudges. I'm just cold and tired and hungry and scared, and I want to get out of here. All right. I nodded. All right. After another 30 minutes of walking mostly in silence, eyes fixed ahead, concentrating on putting one foot in front of the other, Alina said, guys. We stopped. I need the toilet. Okay, sure. We'll turn our backs, I said. I'm going to go behind the trees, she said. I don't. I don't like people looking at me when I. Dot single quote. It was strange to see this punky, confident woman come over all. Koi. I went to hand her the torch but she said, it's fine. I'm not going in far. I looked up at the sky as she walked between the trees, stepping between two thick trunks and slipping out of sight. I checked my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. now. It shouldn't be too long, I hoped, before it started to grow lighter. Are you okay? I said to Laura, pulling her close. Her body was tense, her shoulder muscles rigid. I rubbed them through the cloth of the hoodie I'd given her. I don't want to be a drama queen. Dot single quote. Tears sprang into her eyes. But it's all fucked up, isn't it? Our big trip. What are we going to do without our passports? How are we going to get money out? It will be fine. As soon as we get into town we'll be able to sort. It all out. I don't know. One of my friends at work lost her passport abroad and she had to fly home to get a new one. She couldn't cross any borders without it. The British consulate gave her a document to get home but that was it. We're going to have to go home. I attempted a smile. Maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. But we planned this trip for so long, and we've still got so much to see. Maybe we can go home, sort out our passports, then head back. But not to Romania. Well, I'm sure it's not. Daniel. Okay. Not Romania. I gave her another hug. Nice though it is. She didn't laugh. Please don't write about this on Facebook, try to turn it into a funny story. Daniel. I stepped back. Of course not. Though a few minutes earlier. I had been thinking just that, how at least I'd get an amusing status update out of this. Because it isn't funny, Laura said. I don't want to be reminded of it. I don't want everyone to know about it. Please, Daniel, do you promise me? I tried to hide the disappointment in my voice as I promised. Thank you. Laura looked towards the forest, at the trees Alina had slipped. Between. She's taking a while. She took a few steps towards the line of trees. A couple of half-crushed beer cans lay at her. Feet. Alina. She called. Are you okay? We waited for her to reply. But there was no response. Just silence. Chapter 7. Alina. I called her name this time. Then. Again. Nothing. Laura and I exchanged a look, and I stepped forward, laying a hand on the cool bark of the nearest tree and leaning into the dark space beyond. Alina. I called. Are you all right? Laura stood behind me, breathing heavily, audibly. My own heart was thumping hard in my chest, a cold bubble of air spreading through my body. Where the hell is she? I asked, unsure if I was asking. My girlfriend or the forest itself. Laura called her name too, and her trembling voice bounced back through the trees, echoing and unanswered. She can't have gone in that far to have a pee, surely. I said. Laura stared at me. What if she went in and tripped over something? Bumped her head. Or, who knows, fell into a ditch or something. We need to take a look. Laura took a sharp breath. The edge of the tracks felt like a safe place now. But the forest. The black space beyond the line of trees. My whole body tensed up at the idea of going in there. But we had no choice. I switched on the torch and stepped between the trees, into the exact spot where Alina had entered. Laura followed, holding onto my arm. Even here, just a few steps in, the atmosphere was very different from the relative safety of the tracks. The spiky lower branches of the trees reached out for us, shrubs seemed to grab at our feet. The torch picked out muted colors, dull greens and browns, among the black, jagged shapes of the trees. 
Every dark space felt threatening, as if it contained and concealed something horrifying. My imagination filled in the details that my eyes couldn't see, not just memories from a hundred horror movies and books, but something deeper in my brain, a line that stretched back thousands of years, fear of the dark woods hardwired into me. I shone the torch left and right, up and down, trying to penetrate the darkness, to kill it with light. I tried to take another step forward but my legs wouldn't move. Instead, I pulled Laura back out to the tracks. We can't leave her. We have to go and look for her, Laura said. I was sweating despite the chill in the air. I looked back at the forest. I didn't want to go in there. My lizard brain was screaming at me, flight not fight. Don't go in there. Run away. What if it was a bear? I whispered. Maybe that's what's happened. You told me they were extinct. Not extinct exactly. But rare. We both looked at the tree line. We would have heard something, she said. A scream, growling. Dot single quote. How do you know what a bear attack sounds like? Or it might not be a bear, it could be. Dot single quote. I couldn't say the word that popped into my head. A monster. Could be what? I was desperate not to go back into the forest, felt almost paralyzed by a phobia I didn't know I had. I had never been camping in the woods. Had grown up in the city, raised among concrete and light. But the way Laura was looking at me now was even worse sethen my fear of the forest. Disappointment. We should go and get help, I said. Help. That will take hours. We need to do something now. Or we should wait till it gets light. She looked up at the sky, the moon directly abovious, casting lovely, reassuring light onto the tracks, light that would vanish the moment we entered the forest. How long will that be? She could be in there, unconscious, in need of urgent medical help. Or maybe she's trapped. She could have sprained her ankle. What if she trod in a trap, a snare? Like mine, Laura's imagination was full of images from films. Then why doesn't she cry out? I asked. Shout for help. I don't know. But we have to try to find her. I couldn't live with myself if we just left her, Daniel. Give that to me. She snatched the maglite from my grasp. If you're too scared, she spat the word, then I'll go in on my own. No, Laura. She strode off towards the trees. Come back. I lurched after her, catching her by the shoulder. She whirled around. All right, I said. I'm sorry. We'll go in together. Give me the torch. Why should you? Please. Just give it to me. I couldn't bear the thought of not being in control of the light. Holding the torch, with Laura grasping my free hand, I faced down my fears. I knew I was being stupid. In the daytime I would have happily run into the forest. We just needed to be careful, to watch where we were going. We would be fine. I repeated these words silently. Fine, fine, fine. There's a path, Laura said as we pushed through the first line of shrubbery, following the beam of the torch. She was right, there was a natural path among the trees, about a meter across. Perhaps Alina had found it straight away and decided to walk a little way along it in search of a good place to answer the call of nature. Though why she had gone more than half a dozen steps along it was beyond me. Although I was worried about her, I couldn't help but feel angry too, for putting us in this predicament. Part of me wondered if she was trying to scare us. Or maybe she wanted to get rid of us, had decided that she didn't want to spend any more time in our company. She might have ducked along the line of trees and re-emerged further down the track. We didn't know her. Maybe she thought it would be funny to scare us, would be waiting for us in town with a wicked grin on her face. If we don't find her after 10 minutes, we should go back, mark the place and go and get help. I don't want us to get lost here, I said. Do you agree? Something rustled in the foliage to our left and Laura gasped and grabbed at me, almost knocking the torch from my grip. Laura. Yes, I agree. 10 minutes. I pointed the torch along the path. We could see about 10 meters ahead of us, beyond that, the unknown. Except, of course, my rational brain reminded me, it would just be more path, more forest. Nothing more. 
Imagine this is a summer day, I thought that bright sunshine is streaming through the foliage, dancing on the path. Cute animals peek out from the branches, flowers prettily adorn the path. It's just a big wood. But it didn't work. Instead of dancing sunshine, I saw creeping shadows. There were no cute animals, only the yellow eyes of hungry predators. The pretty flowers were poisonous, deadly nightshade and foxglove. Fallen berries were dotted here and there on the path, and I imagined that they too were poisonous. I took a deep breath, calming myself, and we walked on. Alina, Laura called. I echoed her, feeling a little foolish, worrying too that if there were bears here, our voices would attract them. Something dashed across the path in front of us, caught in the beam of light, and we both jumped. Jesus, Laura breathed. A rat, I said. I think. I looked behind me, swinging the torch, trying to memorize the point at which we'd joined the path. I turned my eyes skyward, hoping to see the moon, or the glow of a star, but the leaves above were too dense. As we walked, I could hear noises in the shadows, small animals and birds, the creak of an ancient tree as the wind stirred it. Laura's hand was warm and damp in mine, but my whole body was cold, mottled with goosebumps. I tried to speak but my mouth was too dry. My chest felt it was about to burst open. I think we've gone in a circle, I said. We've been here before. We can't have. But I was sure I recognized the spot on which we were standing, that the edge of the forest was very close. The urge to flee, to turn and abandon this crazy search, was almost impossible to resist. Maybe she had got lost, had found her way back to the track, was waiting for us there now. I was about to suggest that we go back and check when Laura said, in an urgent whisper. Look. Something lay on the path ahead. It was immediately obvious what it was, but I had to stoop to make sure, picking it up and holding it out to Laura. It was Alina's boot. Black, leather, the zip half undone. Oh my god. I swept the torchlight in a circle around us, searching for the other boot, but it was nowhere to be seen. I opened my mouth to say that we really needed to fetch help, when Laura gripped my hand and said, did you hear that? No. But then the sound came again, faint but unmistakable. A human cry. Oh fuck, Laura said. We have to go back. Dot single quote. But Laura was already moving forward, jogging along the path, and I unstuck my feet and followed her, both of us speeding up as the cry came again, closer this time. As we ran, taking a new, more uneven path towards the source of the noise, the forest seemed to close in on us, and in my nightmares now, when I dream of this scene, I see faces in the trees, laughing mouths and cruel eyes etched in the bark, mocking and jeering at us as we ran slowly forward. And, then without warning, the path ended and we emerged into a large clearing. The ground was flat, stretching the size of a football pitch, the odd tree dotted here and there. Each of these trees was bent, leafless. Dead. And at the center of the clearing, making me blink and stare stupidly, half convinced I was hallucinating, was a house. What the fuck? I said. Laura and I turned to stare at each other. 